this came out of my experience of sitting in way too many faculty rooms over years, having dead-end conversation after dead-end conversation about what to do about education. And all of those conversations were basically about how can we get those kids who are not passing tests to pass tests? Um, and how can we reimagine our curriculum so they're more in line with the tests and all that? I mean, how many of you have been or are teachers? Okay, so you know these conversations. I don't have to spend a lot of time with it. And my hope with this book was to change the conversation, or at least to help to do that, to change the focus from how do we serve the kids to the district to how do we help the schools to actually serve the kids. So, that's what this is about, and that's what I'll be talking about today. So anyway, um, as a longtime teacher, first in K-12 and then at university, I have had a first-hand front row seat at the slow motion train wreck that has been public education since the passage of No Child Left Behind. So, um, so let me tell you really briefly how I came to this story. Um, I taught high school. How many of you taught high school or teach high school? Okay. So I had 150 kids a day, like maybe you do now, five classes. And the idea of actually getting to know 150 students a day is kind of ludicrous. It was very clear that many of the kids who were coming to school were not entirely healthy. They were not getting what they needed outside of school. And that could mean a lot of different things, but they were coming to school increasingly with needs. Um, whether they were physical needs or emotional needs or social needs. And the school wasn't really in a position to offer much help or support to them. And so the more I saw at the high school and the middle school level, it was clear that there was only so much we could do as schools. But there were some things we could do. I moved to elementary, and what really triggered this book more than anything, I would say, is my experience at elementary when I was working with classes that were mostly second language learners. And we would have incredibly good lessons, explorations, we did projects, we focused on what they were interested in and concerned about and all that stuff all year long. And they would get to the end of the school year and take, take tests. So, they, they came up against these, these standardized tests, which were page after page after page after page of contextless questions and passages and all that stuff, and they were slammed. So these kids who had gained strength and confidence and skills and all this stuff ended up feeling like failures and experienced, I would say, trauma from, from being all of a sudden redefined right before their very eyes um, as failures. And it really stirred the question for me of, why are we doing this? Why are we doing things that hurt kids? Why are our schools doing things that hurt kids? And what else could we do? So I started doing research built around this question. What would our schools and communities look like if our highest priority was the health and well-being of our children? Pretty radical thought, right? If we said, what matters is that we have healthy kids. And so that's what I started, um, started out to do. And I did you know, a range of research, ranging from paying good attention to what was happening in my classroom, but then I also had the opportunity to travel around the district as a mentor teacher, so I was in a lot of other people's classrooms. And then I started teaching at university, so I was in a lot of other people's classrooms, confirming what I was seeing on my own, which was there were a lot of kids who were not getting what they needed, and that schools were not set up to help them. Schools were set up to help those who could do just fine. And if you weren't doing just fine, you weren't gonna get what you need. So then that sort of reinvigorated my, my search in terms of, of looking at what I could do. Um, I'm gonna read briefly from the book um, the story of one of my students, just to give you some sort of somebody to picture. As you are listening to this, what I would ask you to do is to picture a student or a young person you know, and you know well, and think about you know, what your hopes and dreams have been for them. Maybe it was a long time ago, maybe it's present day. Um, Mateo, this is for you. Um, and also thinking about students, how you're thinking about your own 
child or the person you're thinking about, how does what you want for them compare to how you think about what you want for other students, for other children? Because again, the title of the book, All Children Are All Our Children, is, is really focused on how do we serve everybody. So this is Sam's story. Sam's not his real name. I want to um, tell you the story of Sam, not his real name. He came to our fourth grade class just after mid-year. He's a member of a Pacific Northwest indigenous nation living with his aunt. Ours was already his fourth school, and his life had been a series of tragedies, crises, and losses, culminating with the death of his parents from alcohol-related illnesses. His aunt was also alcoholic and struggling, but was family and took him in. You're right. Sam's attendance was spotty, to put it in a kindly way. His skills were at a first grade level, and his social skills were marginal. He was often frustrated and embarrassed by his inability to read or to keep up with his new classmates. And his embarrassment sometimes took the form of outbursts or in him isolating himself and keeping apart from other students. By the end of the year, Sam was a bit more involved with others, had poked his head out of his self-imposed shell a time or two, and had done some reading paired with a first grader during buddy reading sessions. He was required to take the standardized tests at the end of the year and, of course, failed miserably. Those tests were clearly painful and humiliating and confirmed for him the sense that he was a failure. Sam was in my class again the following year, and clearly things had changed for him. I think the continuity helped. He was in the same class, knew many of the students, and was increasingly welcomed as a member of the class. Sam was in school and on time every day for the entire year. Getting to school at all, much less on time, meant that he was waking himself up, preparing breakfast for himself and often for his aunt, and then walking about a mile through the usual array of Pacific Northwest winter weather. He became a valued member of the class, now as a fifth grader, reaching out to others, working on common projects, and occasionally contributing to class discussions. His academic skills were still years behind any grade level marker, but were slowly improving, as was his confidence. Hi, Ed. The year-end high-stakes test reflected none of this, as you would imagine. As far as the tests were concerned, Sam was still a failure, scoring far below the passing score. He was reduced to a number, and that was the entire story. We again supported him in every way we could to recognize the gains he had made and to make clear we recognized him for the whole person he was, but he was made less healthy, less whole by the testing and labeling process. Sam was to go off to middle school the next year where he'd be traveling for five or six different classes a day with five or six different teachers, and we knew the transition was not going to be easy for him. We supported him as we could, but off he went. I tell Sam's story because he's a student who faced nearly every issue I talk about in this book. Deep poverty, racism, food insecurity, housing insecurity, substance abuse, his parents and his aunt, chronic stress, isolation due to frequent moves to new locations and new towns, no modeling or advocate standing with him as he tried to make his way in the world, and a school system that focused on his deficits, on his test scores rather than the growth that he showed, and on the character he showed by continuing to simply show up, much less to do the work he did. I picture Sam as I address each of the determinants of health included in this book, knowing there are millions of other students across the country facing one or more of them as well. So there's the question. What can we do to help Sam and to help others who are um, not necessarily fitting the mold that leads to success in tests um, to become more healthy? Um, do we care about Sam and about all our children to live up to our aspirations as a just and democratic society? There is sadly much evidence to suggest we do not yet care enough as a society to make sure all children are growing up healthy. But I believe that despite this evidence, we actually do care, and that once we understand the larger picture, the impact that these larger fundamental issues have on our lives, we can then choose to act to make change. The last chapters of the book focus on actions we can take in schools and in community to support the health and well-being of all our children. We have recently, Jan and I, have recently welcomed our third grandchild into the world. Not as recently as when I wrote this. He's now almost eight months. Adrian is now a month old, it says here. It's a lie. Charlotte and Alden, our more experienced grandchildren, are six and a half and 11 and three quarters, now 12. We, of course, want the very best for them. We want their teachers, their schools, and their communities to be wonderful places for them to grow, to explore, to learn. 
We want them to be supported in every way possible as they investigate the world, as they learn more about who they are and how they connect with that larger world in ways that bring joy to them. It's what all parents and grandparents want. The essential message of this book is that I also want the same for all children and their families, for them to live in communities and in a society that offers them the same opportunities I wish for our grandchildren. So that's kind of the, the basics of, of what I was going for here. Now, we are talking about school and we're talking about health, so we are gonna have a quiz. You do not have to write it down. You can if you want. Um, this quiz is based on the work of St Stephen Bezrushka, who um, is a professor here. We were hoping he's gonna be here tonight. Maybe he'll show up. But he um, teaches, he's an emergency room doctor, but he also is, um, he teaches in the School of, of Public Health. And he came and talked at the Washington State Council Conference in 2005, talking about um, population health and the, that concept of understanding in a, in a large way how we're all impacted by what happens. So he started his, his presentation with a brief quiz and that's what we're gonna do now. So do your best. We didn't pass out number two pencils. Here's the first question. Ranking all countries by life expectancy, how long people live, where does the USA stand today? Are we in the top five? Sorry, Margaret. Um, are we in six to 10? Are we in 11 to 15? 16 to 25? Or are we below 25 when we rank countries in terms of how long people live? What would you say? How many people would go for top five? How many six to 10? Whew. How about 11 to 15? Any takers at 16 to 25? And how about below 25? Well, it turns out that we are, depending on which data you look at, we're either 26th or 35th. Mm. And that's just, well, I don't want to jump ahead. Number two, where did the US rank 50 years ago? Same, same spreads here. So where were we 50 years ago in terms of life expectancy? Top five, raise your hand if you think that was it. Six to 10. 11 to 15, 16 to 25, below 25. 50 years ago, we were in the top five. Okay, so, so now there we are between 26 and 35, and we used to be in the top five. Okay, question three, where does the U.S. rank in infant mortality? The top five means that we are among the lowest rates of infant mortality. So you can see the spread. How many people think top five? How many people think six to 10? 11 to 15? 16 to 25? Below 25? Well, we're 29th. Question four, how much does the US spend on healthcare per person and uh, compared to other wealthy countries? So, so compared to other countries, do we spend much less than they do on healthcare? A little less, about the same, a little more, or much more? Okay, and we'll cut to it because of time. We spend about twice as much as other countries on healthcare. So there, there we are, 26th to 35th in the world, and at the same time, we're spending about as much as the rest of the world combined on healthcare. Okay, two more questions. Well, these two and then another one. What is the largest difference in life expectancy, the average length of length between populations, and by that we mean demographic groups in the US? So what's the, the difference between those who live the longest and those who live the shortest as, as a demographic group? What's your guess? I'm not gonna make you guess, just think about it, it's 38 years. So the people who live the longest in a demographic group live 38 years on average longer than those who live the shortest. And where would you suppose those are? What would you say? What would be your guess? The shortest are men on Pine Ridge Re Reservation. And the, long the longest lived group in the country are white women in Colorado. I don't know what they're doing in Colorado, but Mimi, Mimi we're gonna ask you later. 
Okay, and no, that's good. So just really quickly in the life expectancy, don't expect you to be able to read all this, right? But life expectancy, the longest lived people in the world on average are in Japan. One of the things that's fascinating about that is Japan also has the highest percentage of smokers in the world. Here we are. That's a long way away. 35th, according to this data. These countries, Singapore, Chile, Andorra, Greece, Malta, Slovenia, Cyprus, Liechtenstein, Cuba, Costa Rica, Lebanon, all have longer life expectancies than we do. That's who these yellows are down here. Why is that? What's going on? It's a question. What is the most significant factor affecting the health of the population? Well, how, how do we start to explain what, what we're seeing here? And it turns out that the most significant factor affecting the health of population is inequality. So it doesn't matter what country, it doesn't matter what mix of demographics, it doesn't matter any of that stuff. What matters is the gap in income between the wealthy and the, and the poor. That's it. That's the most, so you know, all of those things cover when you cough and get plenty of sleep and eat good food and all that. That can make a big difference in your individual life. But in terms of the population as a whole, it's really insignificant compared to the, the weight that, that inequality carries. And that's inequality of income, but along with that comes inequality based on race, is based on social factors, based on gender. Um, so it's a, it's a whole package. And a lot of this research is based on the work of um, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, who are researchers from, uh, in, in uh, Britain. And they looked at health statistics, countries all around the world, big, small, different mixes of, of ethnicities and race and all that. And the factors around what we would use to declare some country healthy or not all cluster around those polar places. The more unequal a country is, the less healthy it is. So, and that, that um, is kind of amazing. So what do we do? So, so just briefly, what's happened in the United States, when you say why we used to be healthy and why are we not so healthy now, is we are a whole lot less equal than we used to be. I mean, in the 50s, the top tax rate was 90%. Right? There were strong unions, so there were a lot of jobs that paid living wages and had benefits and health care and all that. Um, there were manufacturing jobs, so people could find work and, and live on it. And um, all of that's really disappeared or is, is way reduced. We are much more unequal than we used to be, and our health has gotten worse as a result. Okay, so. What does that have to do with schools? We're, we're talking about kids, we're talking about keeping or helping kids be healthy. And looking at what's going on in the schools, we have to start recognizing that schools are not living in isolation. They exist in a much larger context in society. And they're caught in the middle between the ideals of democracy and corporate capitalism. So the political system and the economic system and that they are trying to serve both masters and they can't do it. And they are, um, they're caught. So I wanna talk that, about that. Um, and in order to talk about that, first I have to tell you st a story about blue whales and mushrooms. So when I taught elementary, third grade, um, we did a wonderful integrated unit based on the blue whale, which was thought to be the largest organism in the world. We would um, tape out basically the outline of a whale at full size and we'd figure out how many of us fit inside and how, many, how much it weighed and how much it ate and how far it traveled and how fast it traveled and everything we could think of. So there was art, there was music, there was, there was social studies, there was all that, you know, and, and the economics of who hunted them. All, we did all of that stuff. There was only one problem with that lesson and that problem was that the blue whale is not the largest organism in the world. As it turns out, the largest organism in the world is a mushroom. 
The largest organism in the world is a honey fungus. These little honey mushrooms pop up in the forest at some distance from each other. They seem to be discrete, isolated clumps of mushrooms, but they're actually fruiting bodies of the same organism, right? They're all part of the same thing. Um, and this organism has an, is connected by underground networks of filaments that reach out over 3.7 square miles. And it was great. This talk I gave on Sunday was in Chelan, and it turns out that the 3.7 square miles is exactly the same size as the unincorporated urban growth area of Lake Chelan. Couldn't have planned it any better. That's how big these things are. The fungus looks attractive and harmless, and some people even eat them, but it eventually kills their host trees by sucking out their nutrients. Those are the rhizome. Um, so I often think about these mushrooms. What does this have to do with anything? But I think these about these mushrooms when I think about our current times. Like the small clumps of honey mushrooms that we find at various parts of a forest, the issues we face, large and small, local, national, and international, seem to pop up in isolation. On the most local level, there's poverty, racism, substance abuse, dislocation, and alienation that are realities for so many of our students and their families. School funding crises that seem to challenge most every school district across the country, and yet that each district experiences alone and has to deal with alone. The lack of access to health care, the tragedies of drug overdose, homelessness, the lack of jobs paying a living wage that can support a family, closing down of industries that once provided jobs, you can make the list. And as those jobs disappear, the tax base disappears, and so the resources to support an infrastructure disappear. So it sort of mushrooms, so to speak. Sorry. And on the largest level, the bloated military budget that funds perpetual war in countries rich with oil and other valued resources, tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans um, that conspire to steal money from our children, from our towns, in order to make the wealthy even more wealthy, and the trade and tax policies that allowed companies like Amazon to make unimaginable profits while paying no tax. Each of these is too often experienced and addressed as a separate, isolated event. But like the honey mushrooms, they're connected underneath by a vast network of fibers stemming from a common source, and they're collectively sucking the resources and meaning from our lives, destroying the environment in which they're growing. And like the honey mushroom, corporate capitalism is attacking the health of our communities and society. Schooling in the context of corporate capitalism takes on the values of that system, competition, winners and losers, one best way to do things. Some students are found to be more deserving than others, and some students are lost by the wayside, waste from this industrial approach to education, which leads to the question of why schools. So it's a huge question. It's a question you probably haven't thought about since your first year of teacher education school when you had to, um, because who has time to think about questions like that when you've got 150 kids to prepare for? So, but the question of the purpose of schools, we don't ask and treat as if it's a settled question, but it isn't and it never has been. There are different ideas about what schools should be doing and how they should be doing it. Um, so I, I, I said, God, I don't know, that's a big question. So I went and found some quotes from people who have thought a lot about this. One of the people I um, found, and the quote really that gets to the heart of this talk, is from James Baldwin. And oh, thank you, James Baldwin. Um, he addressed the question on the purpose of education in a 1963 talk with teachers. He said, the paradox of education is precisely this, that as one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which he's being educated. The purpose of education, finally, is to create in a person the ability to look at the world for himself, to make his own decisions, to ask questions of the universe and then learn to live with those questions is the way he achieves his own identity. But, dramatic pause, no society is really anxious to have that kind of person around. <laughs> what societies really ideally want is a citizenry which will simply obey the rules of society. If a society succeeds in this, that society is about to perish. The obligation of anyone who thinks of himself as responsible is to examine society and try to change it and to fight it, at no matter what the risk. That's the only hope society has. This is the way that societies change. And that was James Baldwin in 1963. 
Baldwin laid out the contradiction so clearly. What we want for our children to be critical thinkers and passionate learners who care about others and who stand up for justice is someone that no society really is anxious to have around. That's it in a nutshell. People who think for themselves, who are able to see through the smoke screens that politicians and governments and media outlets and history textbooks produce to see the men behind the curtain are much more difficult to control, to program, and are much more likely to challenge the injustice that serves those in power at the expense of those most distant from power. We may want it for our own children, but the thought of everyone's children thinking for themselves and acting in their own interests and in the interests of communities that are not ours is perceived as a threat because it might produce an excess of democracy. And if we have time, I'll talk about excess of democracy. It's quite a story. Um, okay, so one of the places that I've gone with this is to ask this question that somebody I know, a colleague, um, asked of many of us, and I thought it was just really profound. As teachers, as educators, as a society, to whom do we owe our primary allegiance? Right? It's a very complex question. Do, is our primary allegiance to our kids? Steve's nodding. He's answered that question. But it could be to the school, or to the school district, or to the state, or to the parents, or taxpayers. It could be to ourselves. My primary allegiance is to myself. And it could be that we don't owe any allegiance at all to anyone. So how you answer that question makes a big difference about how you approach the work that we do. If our allegiance is to the students, well, it's an interesting question. What would that look like? If my primary allegiance is to the students, and I know that what we're doing in the schools is harmful to them, what do I do about that? If I know that what is included in the curriculum I've been handed by my district or mandated and tested by the state and I know it's biased, incomplete, misleading, whatever word you want to use, what do I do about that? Do I help my students to critically study the impact of inequality, inequality on our health? Do I look critically and deeply at the impact of racism and white supremacy on our entire population throughout our history? Do I help our students to put the current atrocities going on at the border in some context, recognizing that the practice of separating children from their families has happened to people of color on this continent for hundreds of years? Do I make our classrooms and schools a safe place to have honest and difficult conversations based on our best understanding of why those babies? I can't go there because I didn't tell you the story this is based on, so never mind. What do we do is the question. Or do I continue with business as usual, keeping to our regularly scheduled programs? It's not a simple question. So Wilkinson and Pickett said, pretty simply, that rather than put a whole bunch of drugs in the water to get people to survive a state of inequality, the best thing to do is to get rid of it, to address the inequality that we have in our schools and outside of our schools, and to make change. So the last thing I want to do tonight before, before we talk a little bit is to talk about Four categories of actions we can take both inside schools and outside schools that seem to make a significant difference in reducing inequality and improving the health of our, our children. The first is, everybody agrees, is strong relationships. Relationships of adult to kid in the school that everybody, every child in the, stu in the, in the schools has a strong advocate, has somebody who they have a strong connection with who really gets them, who listens to them, who supports them to be who they are fully, who advocates for them, et cetera. It may be the teacher, doesn't have to be. It could be somebody, a coach, could be a, somebody who um, is a music director, could be somebody who works in the front office or a custodian, somebody in the school who really cares. The same is true outside of school, of course, and the librarian, of course. Um, and, um, but, but that's also true outside, and, and hopefully they find that in their families, but not always, in which case we would hope that there's somebody else in the community who can provide that role, but that makes a huge difference. Physical health, making sure the kids who come to our schools are healthy, as healthy as we can, making sure they have good food to eat. That means they're served good food in lunchrooms, it means that there are healthy snacks available, it means that if they're young children 
They're not asked to sit for hours and hours and hours at a desk filling in bubbles that they have enough time to play and move, doing things that support their health in every way possible, that we're connecting with home and, and having the conversations with families to figure out how best to support them in physical health. The third is learning how to learn. And learning how to learn sounds simple, but it's not. Schools assume, many, in many cases, especially since No Child Left Behind, schools assume there's one, one best way to learn and that everybody should learn it, damn it, whether you agree with it or not, whether it fits who you are or not. But we know that that's not useful to, to a lot of kids and that a lot of the kids who are pushed out of school or don't do well are being asked to learn in ways that are not their strengths. Um, and that whole idea of multiple intelligences and learning styles, et cetera, we could theoretically incorporate that into what we do. We did for a while in the 60s and 70s, um, but then that people got scared because of that excess of democracy, which made people unruly and actually think they had a right to you know, have, have thoughts. Um, so we've gone back to basics, which says one size fits all, and that's what we're gonna do, which incidentally is a, um, comes out of the eugenics movement, which was um, not a happy time for a lot of people. So we're still, we're still doing it. Um, so learning how to learn and thinking about the kids who I worked with who felt like they were failures until I talked with them and helped them figure out how they learned best and then gave them the opportunity to learn that way and all of a sudden they got a lot smarter. And the last one is having an opportunity to apply what they've learned um, to what they care about. Right? So I learned how to learn, and now I'm going to give you the opportunity to go pursue my questions, to pursue what I care about, to try to make change based on what I value using what I've learned about how to learn. These things are really important in the school. The other piece I want to say, and then I'm going to close with, is to recognize that schools can't do it alone. That it has to be done in conjunction with a larger community because schools don't exist in a bubble. They are part of a community. Funding comes from the community. The kids are coming to the school from the community or many communities. If they're coming to school unhealthy, if their families are not healthy, they're not gonna be healthy and there's only so much we can do. Uh, one of the things I do at the, in the last chapter of the book is talk about some, some um, community efforts in where we're now living in, in central Massachusetts where there are organizations that have pulled together dozens and dozens and dozens of organizations to focus on doing things together in support of kids' health. Um, it involves the schools, but not only the schools. Uh, there's a Communities That Care program that's actually based on work originally done by um, some professors at the social work school here that is looking at how can we reduce harmful behaviors and increase healthy ones in kids. Again, they have hundreds of organizations working together focused this way. Um, there are, this happens all over the country where communities get together to, to serve kids. When they, when they connect with what's happening in the schools, when they work together that way, there's a lot we can do. If we try to do it alone, it won't work. So let me leave you with one last thought, because how can you not end a, a conversation with Angela Davis? Critical education is truly the practice of freedom. Um, in thinking about health in schools, um, one of the approaches I've been taking lately is talking about standardized tests and stress. And the stress is, is throughout the school. It's not just the, the, the kids, it's the, right. all, the, every, all the adults around them. They're all stressed out about this stuff. And there's, now, recently, been some studies that are looking at actual uh, chemical responses that the kids have. There was a study that came out that, uh, studying New Orleans, population in New Orleans, and it's demonstrating that if you have these cortisol levels <laughs> spike <laughs> or sink, sometimes they sink too. And I'm thinking about the health factor that is something that you can really expand on. Right. Well, and the, you know, that chronic stress, which so many of our people in schools, among other things, inhibits the chemicals we need in order to do learning. Right. So, so the, the, the atmosphere we're creating actually undermines what we say we want. I want to say one other 
there's a lot in the book that it feels overwhelming when you say, well, all it's going to take is revolution. You know, that's a good idea, but, you know, that's not going to happen tomorrow. So a lot of what's in there are what I would call creeper gear type activities, which is a creeper gear is the gear between full stop and first gear in a truck. And the idea is that you can't steer, you can't maneuver a truck when it's just sitting there. But once you get it in motion a little bit, then you can start. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of small things that teachers can do that many of you are already doing, I suspect. Um, and you can build on that. And then when you see that you can actually take an action and it actually makes change, then you're encouraged to do a little more, um, leading up to, you know, revolution. Okay, Doug, you mentioned something about an uh, excess of democracy. It's really an incredible story and, and, and hard to make sense of really from this distance. Um, in the 60s and early 70s, there were a lot of people in the streets. There were a lot of people being active and active against the war, active in terms of working for more women's rights, for civil rights, for LGBT rights. And people felt empowered from a child-centered education point of view where the emphasis was on teaching democracy, teaching people to feel responsible and also um, able to act on their behalf and the behalf of others. And people took that into the streets. They said, yep, I like what I'm learning in school. I feel empowered. I'm going to go out and try to make change. And so there were all these people in the streets, and it made the people in government and people in business very nervous. Um, Samuel Huntington, who was one of the authors of the Trilateral Commission report, um, talked about it. And he said, um, Truman had been able to govern the country with the cooperation of a relatively small number of Wall Street lawyers and bankers. But activism made that much more difficult by the middle 1960s. The population was much less governable because they were much less willing to be submissive. So Huntington noted that previous passive or unorganized groups in the population, such as blacks, Indians, Chicanos, white ethnic groups, students and women, all of whom became organized and mobilized in new ways to achieve what they considered to be their appropriate share of the action and of the rewards, were a threat to the smooth functioning of our democracy, which depended on, and this is the quote, this is the killer quote, the democracy depended on some measure of apathy and non-involvement on the part of some individuals and groups. I mean, there it is. For, for Huntington, for the folks in the Trilateral Commission, for the government, it was harder to run this democracy if people were actually acting, if they were actually being full members of the democracy. And so they wanted people to be passive. They wanted people to be quiet, to go back to where they'd come from as silent, passive recipients of orders of what to do and when to do it. And so he called it an excess of democracy. There was too much of people behaving as responsible citizens in the democracy. And so what that led to was the Back to Basics movement. A lot of the people involved in the Trilateral Commission became part of the Carter administration, and it started going backwards at that time, backwards from my point of view. And with Reagan coming in, it really ratcheted up how, how much more repressive and, and narrow education became. They called it back to basics, and what it meant was sit down, shut up, and do what we tell you. Um, and education started to being blamed for many of the things going wrong in the country. There was a report that came out in 1983 called The Nation at Risk. And they said, oh, the economy's going bad and we're losing to other countries out in the world and it's all because of education. It's all because the kids are not learning what they should. They don't know what they should. People like E.D. Hirsch came on with his books of here's what you should know filled with dead white people. Um, and this list of everybody should know these facts, it was all very restrictive. And it was a, it was a response to the child-centered education of the 60s. And we're still in the middle of that. Well, the um, civil rights movement was mostly organized in churches. But the anti-Vietnam War 
and uh, a lot of the other issues that arose out of that activism, uh, that was all coming from the college campuses. So you could see why that they thought that. Well, and, and one of the things that Huntington did was really take both churches and synagogues and other religious institutions and schools to task for not carrying out their role of pacifying their, their populations. I mean, he specifically said of both of those groups, religious groups and school groups, you're not doing your job, your proper job of keeping people quiet. And um, it's harder to govern. I mean, it's, it's harder to have kids in class, harder in some ways, to have kids in class who really question. It's great, it's the best education, but you have to work in ways that you don't have to work um, if you simply say open to page 15 and do the questions and everybody does it. I mean, it's boring, it's bad education, nobody's getting anything from it, but it's easy to manage. Um, the best education is when you have people challenging and questioning and, and really trying to make, make meaning for themselves. One of the things that's happened in our educational um, well, I would say not only in education, but certainly in education. One of the things that's happened with No Child Left Behind and the like is we've sucked the meaning out of what happens in school. I mean, if the kids are not allowed to, to follow their own questions and interests and concerns, if they're not allowed to research what they find out about what matters to them, there's really very little meaning for them in it, except, okay, they told me to do this, I'll do it. Same for the teachers. The teachers used to be able to work with the students to go after what they considered together to be worth doing. And now given the, the um, pressure from testing and the, and the like, they have much less room to bring their own sense of what's important and what matters. And so many more teachers are burning out or half-stepping it because, because the meaning's been sucked away from them too. The value of what they're doing, they know that what they're doing is not necessarily the best thing they could be doing for kids, but they have little room, many of them, to, to do what they really value and what matters. And so you have this depression that has sort of gone over everyone in the school system, that people are, are they're depressed, they're spiritless, because they've been robbed of that by this, this high stakes testing regime, which is, um, has nothing to do with education and everything to do with money and, and control. So it's a really disturbing trend. I see glimmers around the country of people saying, we know this is wrong and we're actually starting to do something about it, um, to push back. Uh, the opt out or high stakes testing resistance movement is, is one of those. Um, this question has been, well, we've been fighting it for decades. I mean, one of the things um, I did with a couple of colleagues in 2001 is we filed an initiative in Washington State that would have required all politicians to take the 10th grade Wassel, which was the standardized test that was being used at the time, and to put the results in the voters' pamphlet. Uh, they didn't have to pass. They did have to take the test. And one of the reasons we were doing that, of course, was to make the point that when you frame the test as the arbiter of whether it's been a successful education experience or not, you are discounting everything else that happens in a classroom. You're saying it all depends on how you did on this test, which is absurd. And so we were trying to make the point that if that's how you're defining education, then let's do that to the adults. Let's say that anybody who's going to be running for office, you want to know if they're intelligent, right? If, if they're well-educated, let's have them take the test. The same conditions, you know, proctored test, number two pencil, the whole deal. Um, and so, so we filed the initiative and went after signatures. And one of the things that was fascinating about that, I mean, we had no chance of really passing it. We had three of us and no money. Um, but we assumed that teachers would take petitions to gather signatures. And um, we, we found it as an educational strategy to let more people know what was going on about testing in the schools and such, that it would be a good way to spread that word. Many of the teachers said, I love this idea, I fully support it, and I won't gather signatures because I'll get nailed if I do. Even though it's legal, even though I'm allowed to do this outside of school, they were so afraid of the consequences of speaking up 
um, that they were reluctant to do it. And I don't think we'd realized, and this was early in the process, right? It was just around the time No Child was coming in and they were already terrified of speaking out. So one of the things that's happening is that people around the schools, parents and others in the community, don't know how awful it is, don't know the harm that's being done because teachers are not allowed to talk about it. So they say, well, I'm not hearing anything from my child's teacher, so I just assume it's all okay. And it's not, it's not. Um, in New York State, where, where I um, was for 10 years, we actually organized a pretty effective opt-out movement. And we, we really emphasized working with parents, with retired teachers, with people who were out of the reach of the authorities, in a sense in our very relative, our relatively conservative community in up, way upstate New York near the Canadian border in the Adirondacks, we had 60% of the kids opting out of the tests. I mean, that's, that's significant enough that the results they came up with couldn't really be used. Um, you know, there weren't enough, wasn't a high enough percentage taking the test. And the state was really upset about it, but you know, this was the, they were not listening when we asked them to consider the fact that it was hurting children. They were not listening to the fact that we raised issue after issue, that there was no research to support this was better education, that it was simply making a lot of money for Pearson and other uh, publishing companies th whose interest was not education but making money, um, that it was taking away local control from schools because schools were doing what they were told to do from the state and from the feds and that there were fewer decisions being made based on who the kids were and are and about the sense of the people working with them about what the best educational strategies would be. So schools were tying themselves in not saying, how can we raise test scores rather than what's good for kids. State didn't listen, so the opt-out movement was one way to say, this is not okay. We know you're doing something harmful here and we'll this is one strategy we can take to try to stop it. So in New York State, there were more than 225,000 opt-outs each year for several years um, up till the present day. Mm -hmm. So did that have any success? Well, I think 225,000 opt-outs has, has a success. It's pushed some change, but again, the people who are in power, who are in money, um, are not going to give up easily. Um, so they, they've got... Um, They've got the weight of their positions and their, and their dollars on their side. I think it had a significant effect for all those kids who were not being harmed by taking those tests. Um, and I think it empowered communities to recognize that they are not in this alone. I think one of the things I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the, the mushrooms and the tentacles was that everybody feels like they are experiencing what's going on alone. And part of the work of organizing around the testing um, helps communities to recognize that what we're going through over here, they're also going through over there, which means we're potential allies here. We can find each other. Testing is just a, a surface issue. It's, it's a doorkeeper. It's a way of keeping control. It's, it's not, not the it's only not, way. Oh, no. It, it, but it's, it's, it's not the fundamental issue. So dealing with testing you still have all the underlying issues of corporate capitalism, of, of control and power, um, but it's one way of getting through the door to try to try to combat that. Yeah, and then there's the um, privatization of the schools yeah. and the uh, digitalization, you know, if you want to call it that, you know, of all the these corporations like Microsoft and well, all the corporations, you know, are getting in on this and they're trying right. to take the power away from the teachers, you know, and uh, what do you make of all that? Are you well, I think it's part of the same conversation. I mean, it, that, that whole idea of deprofessionalizing teaching, they, they would love to have a standardized curriculum that you open, it, you open up the book and you follow on page one and then you go to page two and you go to three. It doesn't matter who the kids are, it doesn't matter whether they're learning it or whether they're um, interested in it, whether it meets their needs. None of that, it's simply you do what we tell you to do and that way we don't have those troublesome people that James Baldwin talked about of who are thinking for themselves and questioning. We simply have everybody doing what they're told which makes it very easy to manage. That's what they want. And 
the testing is a step towards privatization because if you create tests where you have lots of people failing, for example, when New York State started their introducing their tests, they said up front that about 70% of the kids would fail. Okay, so if you're creating a test that most people are going to fail, then you can say, well, look, the schools are not doing their job. We better bring in the private corporations to run things because public education isn't working. There's no evidence anywhere to show that public education is worse than it was. In fact, it's better than it was, which doesn't mean it doesn't need improving, right? But trying to, cr trying to cast it as failures. 80% of the school districts would be failing according to the results from No Child Left Behind, which is garbage. I mean, it's baloney. Um, so it's, it's taking control away from the teachers means putting all the control in a centralized place where, where you can control everyone else. And that's really part of the goal here. The other thing is that you're making teachers afraid. They tied test scores to teacher evaluations. So teachers say, well, geez, I don't think it's a good idea, but if my kids don't do well in the test, I might get fired, I might get disciplined, I might suffer some sort of consequence, so I'd better toe the line. So it's another way of controlling teachers. Again, it has nothing to do with education. What matters are data points, not education, not the well-being or health of the children. So it's, it's pretty awful. And teachers are so afraid. There's fear up and down the system. Administrators are afraid. School board people are afraid. Teachers are afraid. Kids are afraid. Families are afraid. And when you think that fear is at the heart of an educational system, fear is the antithesis of what you want in a learning community. If people are afraid, they're not going to take risks. They're not going to ask questions. They're not going to want to appear stupid. None of the things that in a healthy community you ask questions. You say, I'm not sure about this. Can you help me? You have kids helping each other rather than being competitive. You're, you have teachers working with each other. You have teachers working with students who have particular needs and trying things out because we don't necessarily know what's going to be most effective. So we try things and we adjust and we listen. You don't have time to do any of that with a, with a, a testing dominated setup. And you've created people who are really fearful. The other thing I want to add to that is that teachers have learned or think that if they do nothing except what they're told, if they're being good little doobies, that that's a good thing to do and they're not being political. And that's a political act. The, the pretense is if you do what the state hands you, if you do what the textbooks tell you, you're doing a neutral, you're pre presenting a neutral curriculum, a neutral educational experience. And that if you bring other materials in, suddenly there's a bias introduced. But people like Howard Zinn were very clear that there is no neutral curriculum, right? That it has a point of view. It's representing the point of view of those in power who want to stay in power. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite an uh, encrypted system, not encrypted, but a, a tangled system that, that all leads back to, to the control of those in power um, and, and to the deficit of the health and well-being of the kids. Yeah, what was that? Uh, Howard Zinn said there's... You can't be neutral on a moving train. Yeah. That's, that's the line. I wanted to ask you about um, Michael Moore. You know, he had that film on who, who to invade next. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, Finland had the best schools. And they didn't have homework. And they, they had, like, uh, a lot of the day was in recess. Mm -hmm. And I think they only spent about three and a half, four hours in a classroom. Yet the students uh, seem to do better than anywhere else. And so it kind of gets to the point of what is education? Well, and I think it comes back to, well, there are a lot of things. Finland, the Finland story, again, is a complicated one. They came out of World War II feeling like their economy was a mess, their educational system was a mess. And they said, what are we going to do? I mean, it's not an easy situation to figure out. And what they said was, well, our most important asset is our people. So we're going to invest in them. And what they decided to do was adjust their economy to make changes in their economy so that it was more equal. 
so that rather than have a lot of people who were really poor and a few who were wealthy, they would do what they could to equalize the incomes and social supports and all that across the, across the entire population and to make sure that there was health care and all those things for all of the people in the, in, the, in, the, in the country. At the same time, they said everybody in the schools is going to get equivalent educational experience. Didn't matter where you lived, didn't matter what school you were in. The buildings were going to be in equivalent shape. The, the, the teachers were, were going to be trained and uh, have the same levels of expertise. The curriculum was going to be equivalent so that what happened in one school was going to be about the same thing as what happened in another school. So equalizing all that led to better health, a better economy, and better education. Teaching is one of the, mo one of the highest um, valued professions in Finland. It's well respected, you need a lot of education, it pays well, it's a, a, people are treated with respect and dignity as teachers, and only one out of every ten people who wants to get to be a teacher gets to be a teacher. They reject nine of them because it's such a valued profession. And so we, we've made other choices here, like in, in the 50s and 60s we were more equal, and we've gone in the other, other direction so that we're much less equal. And so our education's worse, our, our economy is worse, our health is worse. So, so it's, it's a matter of policy that has really geared the economy and, the, and, and our health downward. That also says we could move it back up again if we made that choice. Um, you know, the, the question really is for teachers and for the community, when you have a democracy that isn't democratic, when you have a justice system that isn't just, when you have a system of checks and balances that is really unbalanced by the size of the checks that some people are throwing out there, what do you do? What is our responsibility as teachers and as parents and community members? Do we simply continue as business as usual or do we take action to say, wait a minute, what we're doing is making our children less healthy to make our planet less healthy and we need to change that. We need to stop the train. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you.